Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. I'm declaring tonight SG Night. I've hand-selected some unique SGs to share with you tonight. Let's get into it. Starting with this one being offered by Chicago Music Exchange. It's advertised as a 61 SG Les Paul that is heavy aged in Polaris white. So when I first saw this, I was like, sweet, a two pickup SG custom. Generally, these things get three pickups. That's just how SGs have been since their introduction into this body style. And the aged white finish always looks pretty good with those. This one, despite being called heavy aged, I would say so far a lot of the aging is tasteful. Like you just have a little bit of arm wear right here. A couple of nicks and dings. I like the way that the aged vibrola arm matches the finish so well. But a lot of guys don't like these SG Customs because of that third pickup. So occasionally you get ones like these. Makes me think of the Elliott Easton SG signature model. However, if you read that title very carefully and looked up here, this isn't an SG Custom. It's actually a standard. <laughs> that looks so wrong because it's dressed up just like a custom, but it's kind of cool at the same time. It also brings up the fact, what is the difference between an SG standard and an SG custom? A lot of it just comes down to aesthetic appointments. However, these things don't have like binding along the body, so you can soup up an SG standard to kind of look like a custom outside of the neck attributes here, such as our headstock no longer having binding, not having the custom emblem, but this still looks pretty darn good, right? The fretboard's bound on either models except for this one. You got a rosewood fretboard with the trapezoid inlays versus ebony fretboard with real mother of pearl block inlay. Then as far as the back, they did a lot of heavy aging back here as well and it has a unique CME serial number. So how much do they want for this? Whoa! <laughs> I don't know, if you're asking me, I, I would rather just have an SG Custom at that price, but to each their own, you're free to buy whatever you want. Now let's flip over to another cool one from 2004 that's a little bit more affordable. We've got one of the sweetest SG Voodoo's I've ever seen. So it's got all that ringy wood grain that I love on these things. It's an ash body, so it's going to look a little bit different than most Gibsons that you've seen. And to make things even cooler, your black plastics have red accents on the numbers and the lettering. But this one's more so 68 in style with the bat wing pick guard, which I think works really well with this vibe. Looks like maybe an aged Nickel Bigsby with a chrome arm and chrome pickup covers. But then when you flip over to the back, you can see some more interesting wood grain on this one. Now obviously somebody's had like maybe Maybe a pick holder right here, or maybe it's just random stickers. That's why you've got some sort of a shadow. But then when you get to the full body shot, this is what makes the Voodoo series kind of interesting. You get that red skull. You either like it or you don't. And then they get the ebony fretboards, the matching red Gibson logos. And apparently this one had some more stickers on it at one point in time. You know, I'm kind of questioning, is that actually sticker shadow or is it just the rest of the guitar is still very dirty and needs to be cleaned? I'm sure it's a little bit of both. But the other cool thing about the Voodoo series are the cases. So black interior, nothing too fancy, but red snakeskin exterior, just like the Nikki Six bases that we reviewed in this episode. So the elephant in the room on this one is somebody has converted it to this Bigsby. It originally had a stop bar tailpiece that you can see the capped off studs right here, but that one's available at about $1,500. And wow, located in Australia and they're only going to ship it to you for $150? Trust me, <laughs> it costs more than that. I think the cheapest it's ever been to send something to Australia was about $400, bucks. but generally you're about at that $450 to $550 range. Here's another one around a similar price point. I don't think I realized these things existed. So we've got an SG Junior with an ABR1 bridge and a TP6 tailpiece. Now the TP6, that's not stock, but the stop bar tailpiece phenomenon on this is stock. Now you can actually go all the way back in my episodes and find like a late 80s, early 90s version of like a Les Paul Jr. done up in this setup. I did know about those, but I didn't realize they also did SG variations on it. So instead of having a normal wrap tail piece on these, they get all the intonation of that. You can even find melody makers in this era that I view as just complete sleeper models because they're so well specced. So besides raising awareness that yeah, these things exist, I wanted to really look at the condition of this one. I don't know what happened to it. Like we've got a lot of vertical finish checking, which can mean moisture damage. And sure, we've got some nicks and dings, cracked pick guards, but you see that on almost everything. It's got fret wear. But when you get back here, once again, we can see some sticker shadow with some sort of a flame, but something went on with our finish. Like it is just completely flaking off the neck here and bubbling along the edges. I can't imagine that would feel that good to play because all of this like flaking of the finish is happening on the neck the one place where you have a lot of contact with. So my best guess is this was probably in like a house fire or close to a heating source. And maybe that's why they put the flame sticker on the back because it survived. And hey, it looks like we got some Fraley style tuners back here. And now to be fair, 
This might have happened naturally because that is a phenomenon that happens on a lot of 90s Gibsons, but it could also be attributed to moisture damage. Doesn't look too bad from a couple of feet away though, but that one is currently being offered for $15.50. But if you're interested, make him an offer. He's open to it. Next up, let's talk about these things again. Probably one of the coolest 12-string Gibson guitars to exist outside of the double-neck EDS 1275s. It's an SG that's built as neck through construction, just like a Firebird, and then they give it the giant headstock on there. I mean, I've got that 12-string Les Paul in my personal collection. You could check out the review and demo here. I wish there was a neck through Les Paul version like this thing, because Gibson also has a 12-string that's not a neck through. But this is one of those models that I really want to review one day when I can find the right deal because it's just so fascinating to A, have the neck through SG, and B, it's probably better for the length of the life of the guitar that it is a neck through and having all that tension on the neck. These are definitely out there if you want one. Sometimes it just takes a while to find somebody willing to sell it. These single guitar 12 string Gibson electrics, they're kind of collector's items in a way because they didn't make them for too long, but it wasn't that long ago that these things were even made. But you'll notice we have the kind of smaller Grover tuners on here. That's probably to help fight neck dive because these Grovers are a little bit lighter. The only thing I don't love about these is the pick guards look a little bit weird because they have to shift them over here because of the whole neck through design. If only they could have had like a stair stepped pick guard to cover over that. But maybe that just sounds better in theory rather than in practice. But this one's being offered at just a little under 5,000. And ooh, seven pounds, 12 ounces. That one might be neck divey. However, since it's neck through, that might help with that because you might have more mass within the body. Now let's check out this custom shop from 2009. I had to click on it because it was called SG Spy, pilot run number one. It's like, I've never heard of this. We go through here, it's just kind of like a, a TV yellow-esque finish, maybe a little bit more brighter than TV yellow, but it's an SG special, wrap tail piece, two P90s built to historic style specs. It's an absolutely gorgeous looking guitar, extra dark fretboard. I mean, it almost looks like it's slightly lacquered, but I doubt it, I doubt it is. It's probably just some sort of reflection of the lights. But flipping over to the backside, everything looks, you know, pretty standard for this. We've got the historic style heel join, nothing too fancy going along around the sides, but then we get to our headstock. Gives the mother a pearl, small button tuners, and then the back, SGSPY, Pilot Run 1. So this one just left me with more questions than answers. So it must not be SG Spy. That has to be like an acronym for something special about this guitar and its finish. So SG obviously for SG. And then super special yellow. <laughs> Doubt that's what it is, but feel free to leave your guess down in the comment section below. But as far as I care, yeah. Super special yellow works for me. Unfortunately, reading the description doesn't give us any answers either. And all the official specs just seem typical. Next up, we have an SG Goddess from 2006. I have documented a couple of these, even though I mainly focused on the Les Paul Goddess series. I have documented one of each color, but I saw this one and went, huh, that's not an official color of an SG Goddess. So of course I had to check this thing out. Somebody has repainted it in this hot pink color, which if you happen to be a Goddess collector, something like this might interest you because it already exists. You're not defacing one that's already the original finish. I could see how somebody might be interested in purchasing it just because of the fact that it's been redone. Now, if I remember correctly, the Goddess series is gloss on top, but satin on back. So if that's how the SGs were also done, that's something that has changed here. And unfortunately, they didn't go for like any type of like a pink burst, like dark pink around here, light pink center. It looks like we can just barely make out our serial number here anymore, as well as the Made in USA stamp, but a little bit better than Done. Looks like we have locking Schaller branded Klusen style tuners. At least that's kind of what it looks like by these black knobs up here. They might be lockers. Could be wrong, but that means the original Grovers are gone and new holes had to have been drilled for the headstock. They still left it alone with just being a master volume master tone with three-way toggle switch and output jack on the front, but they've swapped out our pickups for some boutique stuff and we have an intonatable pigtail wrap tail piece, which is a very common modification with the Goddess series. But how much is he asking? Only about a thousand bucks. I would say that's a very fair deal. If you're located in France, I mean, especially if you're local to him in France, you don't know what's hiding underneath the refinish. People don't just refinish guitars for absolutely no reason. There is a very good chance there might be a heel crack repair or a hidden headstock break. I mean, there's just no way to know unless they have photos of the whole process of it. So that's why if you do a refinish project, Document, document, document. It's gonna save your butt if you ever have to sell that guitar. And to end out tonight's SG Spectacular episode, take a look at this. When is the last time you've seen an SG Custom from the early 70s in left-handed? 
Occasionally, you'll find SG standards. It's more common to find the lefties in the late 70s than the early 70s, but they do exist. I've actually had a few a long time ago on the channel back in the carpet days. But I was just flabbergasted to see one of these show up one night and in relatively clean condition. It's got good wood grainage. It's all gold hardware with some minor wear and tear, which is probably of a detriment to a left-handed player that wants to buy one of these, you know, to play it. This one probably more so speaks to a collector due to its good condition, but don't be too scared, guys. The further you go into it, more things disqualify it from being a collector guitar, like it's been refretted. That's not necessarily a bad thing in the early 70s. Those frets are pretty small, but it's kind of surprising to see something so clean be refretted like that. It kind of makes you think, was it refinished? However, from the photos, I don't see anything like overly jarring to make me think that. But obviously, if you're interested in this guitar after seeing this, do your own due diligence to make sure it's the original finish. But I'm not seeing anything too crazy here. Headstock volute intact, no headstock break, crack, or anything like that, which is very common on 70s SGs. Hey, we even still have the original Waffleback tuners on here. But what if I told you there's an additional surprise on this one? So the original case looks like this, right? They're awful cases. They're not very protective at all. The padding is very minimal. They also have clasp latches, so not the good locking down kind. That's stuff that can accidentally come undone, so you want to lock those cases. But look at that. I love it. Somebody has redone the interior, maybe added a little bit of extra padding and just made it kind of psychedelic. I can appreciate that on many different levels. And I think it was a nice touch that they only did one side. Like they could have went crazy and did the top two, but a little bit of crazy is okay, but not a lot of bit, right? <laughs> And with that, I'll leave you for tonight. Thank you for watching Troglodytes. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.